Hi, so nice to be on here with you. How are you? How are you doing? I am good. My video setup is a little precarious because my ring light is broken. So I was going to put a ring light, but I have like this sun <laughs> that's ready to set. That's serving as my natural light. It's been so hot here in New York City since my hair is flying. It's just of the electric fan and it hasn't been fun with all of the heat. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm like in the opposite situation. I've actually kind of accidentally went into the winter in Brazil which I oh, didn't wow. realize it was like people told me it was winter but in my head I just kind of was like oh but it's Brazil it's it'll it's, be fine but it's there's been some really cold times wow. so, yeah. honestly I'd prefer that right now and yeah. also it might be like in everyone's essential view I have like a developing pimple in my nose and I look like <laughs> Rudolph right now I feel like Christmas is coming so early, but it's okay. <laughs> That's fine. Christmas in August, why not? Well, I was watching like the, the show Never Have I Ever on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen that. And I've heard about it. I think I was, it, it's so good. I really recommend it for anyone who wants a Netflix watch, but it's like about kids in high school. And literally after watching it, like I was binging it for several days and then I got a pimple app and I was like, did I just like um, reject to high school because I'm watching the high schoolers on TV? I think exactly. watching the show manifested it, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But then again, thank you so much again for being here all the way from Brazil. We connected on LinkedIn, I remember when, months ago. And it's a very, very, very interesting and intriguing story. And I just knew that one day we have to chat here for everybody. If you could first please introduce yourself to everyone. Absolutely. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. I love having just like deep conversations with people. I think that's one of my favorite things. I've started a podcast recently. I just love getting in depth with conversation. So hello, everybody. I am Chelsea Turgeon. I am a former OBGYN resident through medical school, started doing an OBGYN residency. And during my second year, I had a lot of like value shifts and realizations and burnout and all these kind of things came together in sort of a perfect storm. And I ended up resigning from residency. And this was at the end of 2018. So about three years ago now. And I immediately <laughs> boarded a plane to South Korea and I got a job teaching English, which is so random, right? To go from being a doctor to teaching English. It was definitely an interesting <laughs> transition a lot of things changed my life all at once I changed my career I changed where I live I sold all my stuff like all these things happened all at once and I spent that year teaching English but also I had so much time that I never had during my whole medical school residency journey I think I had just this huge gift of time I don't know if you feel like this but just I, I finally was like I have every single weekend off for the entire year and I had not had that in mm -hmm. So long. And so I was able to use that time to really do a lot of, I guess we could call it soul searching. That might sound a little mm -hmm. cheesy, but I just did a lot mm -hmm. of like connecting to myself, who, who I am, who I want to be, what I really want to do. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I also started building up an online business, started off as a life coaching business. And I realized my clients and I all kind of gravitated towards the same topic. Eventually we all got around to career. And so then I ended up just becoming more of a career coach and pivoting to start helping healthcare workers. So that's what I do right now is I help healthcare workers who are feeling burnt out and unfulfilled, I help them mm -hmm. find a way to discover the work they enjoy and then start doing the work they love mm -hmm. on their own terms. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Thank you so much for the introduction. For those who don't know the gravity and the magnitude of the whole medical process, it is such a hard and long process, right? It's like you ramp up everything in you to reach that point, right? First, you go through undergrad, four years usually, doing all of these things to fill up your application with clinical work, volunteers, letters of recommendation, taking the MCAT. And then you go to four years of medical school and then X many years of residency. So you dropped out part way through your second year of OB residency. But still, you have allotted like almost 10 years of your life thus far, right? Getting to there. I first wanted to ask, was there a motivation into entering the medical field in the first place? Was there like a family member that you were like, oh, this is what I want to be in the future? Yeah, that's such a good question. And, you know... As I look back in hindsight, I can really see that my motivation for going into med school was very superficial. And I think that can be true for a lot of people <laughs> in general for their careers, because we like when we're maybe 17 or 18 years old, I was 17 when I went to college and mm -hmm. 
you like you're kind of asked to pick a major right mm -hmm. away and then it, that needs to lead to a job like you're just kind mm -hmm. of shuffled on this conveyor belt where mm -hmm. you need to make these really big decisions that impact your future from a, a place of like you don't know anything about yourself right mm -hmm. you all you've done is like go to school and like maybe done some sports and extracurricular mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of self-awareness there mm -hmm. and so from that place my my level of self-awareness was I do well in school, right? I'm like, I knew I was like academically gifted. I like to help people and doctors make good money and mm -hmm. they, you know, it's a more of like a noble career profession, yeah. like where people respect it and yeah. it's prestigious and all of that. And so I think yeah. it just kind of checked enough boxes. And I was like, yeah, this seems like mm -hmm. a great idea. I was majoring in psychology. Mm -hmm. Like I knew that like it's psychology has always been the thing I'm obsessed with and that I love. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was my major. And then mm -hmm. from there I was like, well, I either am going to go to medical school or graduate school. Mm -hmm. And as I kind of would tell people like, you know, everyone in college, everyone asked, what are you majoring in? And you would <laughs> share the things and you share about your career path. And I would notice I would get so much validation when I told people I might go to med school. They'd be like, oh, mm -hmm. you must be mm -hmm. really smart. You want to be a doctor. <laughs> and so I think that kind of fed my ego in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and was probably one of the things that really influenced me to choose the medical path instead of like graduate school yeah i will agree to all of that of all the doctors too that i have spoken to so far in this chat they always mention the importance when i ask oh what what is one thing that of advice that you would give to a pre-med or medical student, they would always say something along the lines of, oh, make sure you're in it for the right reasons. Because yeah. there are so many reasons that one might want to get into medical school. It could be money, it could be prestige. But obviously there are those who also really want to get into the field because they can't imagine themselves doing anything else yeah. but this. And there are other demographics like nationalities, right? They, I would always read it on like Reddit or in YouTube comments that, Oh, I have to go into medicine because medicine. in my culture, it's either medicine or none. Stuff yeah. like that, right? <laughs> but still, the amount of time that you studying that you have done to get through medical school, was there a point sometime in that journey, even prior to residency in medical school, that you really felt, oh, this is not for me. I should quit now. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, too. You're so good at <laughs> asking <laughs> these deep questions and, like, really getting the story. So, yes, there... There was a point, it really started during my third year of medical school. So the way my med school was set up is the first two years mm -hmm. are just very academic, very like book heavy. And mm -hmm. then the third and fourth year are more clinical heavy. And so there was a point during my third year after I started like actually going into the hospital and seeing patients mm -hmm. that there was a lot I didn't love about it. Mm -hmm. And if I was being super honest with myself, I was like, this is not what I want to do. It was almost like an expectations versus reality type mm -hmm. of a thing where in, in my mind, I kind of had this like thought of like, this is what it's going to be like when I'm a doctor mm -hmm. and all this mm -hmm. glam mm -hmm. and Grey's Anatomy kind of stuff. And yeah. you kind of get there and you're like, yeah. oh, it's a lot of paperwork. And it's a lot, it's mm -hmm. a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. And every job, every career has mm -hmm. those things, right? Mm -hmm. But it's important to find the career that like you love it enough that those things don't bother you, right? Like Mark Manson <laughs> talks about that, that everything sucks some of the time. Yeah. You just yeah. have to kind of find the suck that you're willing to tolerate yeah. the stuff yeah. that's in service of yeah. what you really want. And I, I like during that time, during my clinical year, the negatives are not really worth it for me. And I don't mm. really find much joy mm. in the positives, but I was able to really rationalize it the way we all do with the fun little delayed gratification game of like, oh, I don't like it now, but... I'm in, you know, I'm just, it's because I'm a medical student and I don't feel very useful. But I'm an attending. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it'll be better when yeah. I'm doing this, this, and this. Yeah. But the truth was, I didn't like being in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, I didn't like being there. And so it's just like hard to really reckon with when, yeah. like you said, you spent so much time training. Yeah. And so, yeah, there was definitely a time during third and fourth year where I was like, Ooh, is this really what I want to do? And at that mm -hmm. time, I also started um, listening to a lot of podcasts and getting really mm -hmm. into this personal growth mm -hmm. world and starting to see that, oh, mm -hmm. people have online businesses. That's a thing. Oh, coaching. That's a thing. My mm -hmm. mind started to just become more aware of these other mm -hmm. career paths, mm -hmm. but I, I wasn't ready to throw it all away because I really mm -hmm. did, you know, if I'm actually working in the field. So like when I'm a resident and I have an actual mm -hmm. job and a role, mm -hmm then I might like it more because medical students, 
as I'm sure you've seen in the hospital, yeah. they kind of like they don't really have anything to do. <laughs> They're just lost little lambs. Yeah. And so I was like, don't anything, okay? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Don't so I was anything. like, well, I'll feel better when I have an actual role and people yeah. are counting on me and like I'm yeah. supposed to be there. In med school, I always felt like I'm not really supposed to be here. Got it, got it. After graduate, obviously smart beyond wonders, you know, passed all got great scores and all of those step exams, graduated medical school. You finally had that doctor of medicine MD after your name. I was wondering if, did that give any sense of fulfillment for you doing that time that, oh, I finally finished. I have the MD after my name. It really didn't. It, uh, it really didn't at all. It mm-hmm. felt so like pointless. <laughs> and I, mm-hmm. as, as graduation approached, mm-hmm. residency was approaching. And I really yeah. started to just feel this impending sense of like you were on a conveyor belt and it was mm-hmm. going and you were kind of getting sucked into one of those like mm-hmm. machines that crushes mm-hmm. you. I don't mm-hmm. that's not a real yeah. thing, but I, I felt like I was getting closer and closer to like, yeah. I, don't know, I couldn't really articulate it, but I just felt this dread building and building and I was having wow. panic attacks and just feeling this sense of like, yeah. I don't want to go in there. Don't make me go in there. But I, yeah, I wow. thought I was just nerves about moving or transitioning or yeah. something like that. But it was really very interesting because you can see the dichotomy of there are those students, medical students, who as graduation is approaching, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I'm finally going to be a doctor. Comes graduation day, they get their diploma and they're crying their eyes out because this is what they wanted their whole life. And then there's you who, since medical school, like, oh, this is not for me. Still, you went through the whole intern year. And then in your second year, can you take us back to when was that point or it's probably a series of months and days where they're like, no, I really have to say goodbye to medicine. Yeah, no, like you said, it's a series of moments and they keep building Mm -hmm. until and you can you can override it until you can't Mm -hmm. anymore. Right. So Mm -hmm. there's like for me, the way it worked was there's like this sense of like in my gut of like you walk into the hospital and it's like, I don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. And it doesn't really make sense to me, Mm -hmm. but I just don't want to be here. But you can Mm -hmm. ignore that and ignore that for Mm -hmm. long enough until you can't. And so for me, when I finally couldn't, it was because I got to this place of such severe Mm -hmm. burnout Mm -hmm. that I really I wasn't able, like, it was really hard to drag myself out of bed. My alarm mm-hmm. would go off. I'd hit snooze as many times as mm-hmm. I could. It was like, I just mm-hmm. don't want to physically move. Mm-hmm. And then I would get into the hospital and would want to, like, sneak off to take naps whenever I could. I was behind on all my clinic notes. Like, attendings were calling me and mm-hmm. saying, hey, like, can you finish those discharge summer? You know, it was just mm-hmm. like everything was piling up. And it was like, mm-hmm. I can't keep it together anymore. And so I met with my program director at that point, And she already knew I was kind of. Mm-hmm. having doubts about mm-hmm. wanting to mm-hmm. pursue continue mm-hmm. with residency mm-hmm. and yeah we decided that I could take a five-week leave of absence which was so uh, crucial and that was really just a way for me to put like a pause on everything mm-hmm. and kind of mm-hmm. take a step back and mm-hmm. have some time and space to think about what my next moves were and I think mm-hmm. <laughs> I think my program thought it would be like okay she's gonna like rest recover from burnout come back ready to go little did they know i was like oh, actually peace yeah. out peace out it's very interesting you know my mom she's been a nurse for 30 years and 30 years is a long time and i'd always ask her what keeps you like getting up out of bed in the morning and going to work and she's like she says as all jobs and as all professions it's always hard there's always bad days but she said she'd always look forward to go into work and she feels like she's not working which is obviously not the truth for everybody yeah. and especially in your case of you don't want to be in the hospital right that feeling of you're probably being crushed every day of having <laughs> to wake up the alarm to go to the hospital yeah. and there's definitely burnout like i guess emotionally and mentally from that thought of i really don't want to be here but also i feel like we cannot ignore the fact that the life of a resident really is not easy at all i don't know um i I don't know if it differs for every state or for every specialty but definitely intern you right 100 hours of working each week there's literally almost no break and you're learning as you go and the amount of stress of doing stuff and as a doctor right and you're expected to know your things straight Mm -hmm. out of medical school how much do you think of your burnout is solely just the lifestyle of a medical resident versus 
that psychosocial aspect of I don't want to be here? Or is, do you think it was a combination of both? Yeah, like, no, that's such a good point because like you can be burnt out even when you're doing like a career that is mm-hmm. just the right fit mm-hmm. for you. And mm-hmm. it is like, this is the only thing I ever want to do. You're mm-hmm. still not meant to work a hundred hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> even if you love it, yeah. you are a human, not a robot, mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. need to sleep. Mm-hmm. So that's that's been something I have found out now that I'm doing work I really love. I still mm-hmm. know that like because I, I can get caught up and be like I'm yeah. working all night because yeah. I love editing this podcast and there's yeah. all these and I yeah. like, I want to do a client call here and here and here and like yeah. I can get burnt out from doing something I really love. So regardless of what work you're doing, you still mm-hmm. need rest. You still mm-hmm. need things to do outside of work. You still mm-hmm. need to like take care of like the humanoid that you are mm-hmm. because I think. <laughs> I think a lot of times, like, especially for residents, like, they're not really treated like humans in a lot of ways. It's just like, not at all. Courses, like mm-hmm. get this done. Get, and it's, mm-hmm. it's like the work hour restrictions. Mm-hmm. That's just restrictions for how long you're supposed to be in the hospital. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't even take into account all the work you take home with you, which yeah, is all the is. patient notes you have to catch up on, mm-hmm. all the discard summaries. You're all studying, the, like, even in the residency. And you're right? studying. There's exams that you take. Yeah. Like, yeah. and every, and, and like you said, it's different for different specialties. That's not everyone's experience, but especially in a surgical specialty. So like mm-hmm. OBGYN is like semi-surgical. Mm-hmm. And so in any sort of surgical specialty, there just seems to be an extra level of intensity mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you're like cutting people open. So I guess that's yeah. reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, there, there's yeah. like, yeah, like you said, the life of a resident, even if someone loves it, mm-hmm. it's not easy. And mm-hmm. And I would argue like there's a lot of things that really need to change mm-hmm. with that. And they have changed. They're like moving in the right direction. It's definitely mm-hmm. better than it used to be. Mm-hmm. But a lot of flex to be done. Healthy. Yeah, not at all. And I wanted to progress this conversation of a resident life into your story of okay, the program director gave you five weeks to decide. And obviously it, it was probably was not what they were expecting because you said peace out. Um, but I feel like what's so climactic about your story is that decision to leave, which is probably not easy because it's not just, oh, this is this is what I'm feeling. But for those who don't know, you incur so much debt from medical school. Medical school is not cheap whatsoever. And while you are in residency, you are not paid a lot, right? Or yeah. enough at all no. <laughs> as your medical debt loans are incurring interest and then also there's the thought of oh what will other people say what if the if there's i'm not sure if there's one but if, what is that one factor that made you bypass all of those thoughts about the debt that's there and what other people will say what is that one thing that you're like no, no no it's about me and i'm saying peace out yeah no so i had a pretty like memorable and significant moment for each of those. Cause to me, I kind of dealt with them separately. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the first one that I kind of overcame in my mind was the, mm-hmm. what will people think of me? Mm-hmm. Because this is especially true when you're in medicine, you don't really have much time. And so a lot of your mm-hmm. friends are your coworkers and the people, mm-hmm. so your world is pretty small in mm-hmm. the fact that, you know, most of my friends were like my friends from medical school mm-hmm. <laughs> who are doing their own residencies. Yeah. And then my friends in residency I had lost touch with a lot of friends from college mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. of how intense it is to, mm-hmm. <laughs> to go through medical school and mm-hmm. you just mm-hmm. I mean that doesn't have to be the case but that's yeah. what it was for me and yeah. so so your world is pretty small and so basically everyone you know mm-hmm. and this isn't always true I'm just kind of sharing my experience but yeah. basically everyone I knew and was friends with was in medicine now my family's not in medicine so that like at least had that um mm-hmm. where it was like a different outlet and so there, that was a big one for me it's like what will people think because mm-hmm. it was all the people I knew yeah would think something about it it was basically yeah. like I'm yeah. gonna need some new people and but I was so I was I think I was like on Instagram one night just like laying mm-hmm. in bed in in mm-hmm. my burnout and I was like I'm worrying about what other people think about me but they're not here with me right now, mm-hmm. right? Like I'm mm-hmm. worrying about what they would perceive about me, but mm-hmm. I'm the only one who has to live my life. Yeah. Like they, they don't come along with me all throughout my day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have to deal with the consequences of my decisions. Mm-hmm. They're not here. Like it just like became this moment of realization of like, they're not here with me right now. So then mm-hmm. 
I'm the one that matters, right? Like I, yeah. I'm here with me. I need to take care yeah. of me before I yeah. worry about other people. Yeah. So that felt like a breakthrough. It seems like a nothing when I'm sharing it. I'm like, <laughs> that doesn't seem like anything. But to me, I was like, whoa, this yeah. is a breakthrough. And so then yeah. I was like, okay, I don't really care what people think. I have to make the decision for me. Mm-hmm. And then the next barrier, the next mental barrier were the finances. So for the longest time, I had really just accepted that, well, I don't like it, but there's nothing I can do. I got to pay back my loan somehow. <laughs> and yeah. I had just kind of accepted that as a fact that one, like I have to pay back my loans, which like, that's true. But then two, like the only way to make significant money at this point for me <laughs> at the mm-hmm. ripe age of, I was like 26 at the time. Mm-hmm. The only way I can make significant money is by continuing this, seeing it through and becoming a doctor. Mm-hmm. And so that's just, that's just not true, but it wasn't, I wasn't able to see that at the time. And mm-hmm. so I was on the phone with like a physician burnout coach mm-hmm. and she was asking me these questions and these are pretty typical coaching questions. It mm-hmm. was just like, tell me about your dream life. Where do you want to be? Like, what's your perfect day? And I described this whole life, mm-hmm. which is basically what I'm doing now, where I was like, oh, I would wake up and just kind of have a chill morning routine. And then I'd go to a cafe and mm-hmm. I kind of described this whole life. And she was like, okay, so like, is that, are you a doctor in this life? And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think this is the doctor. And then she's like, okay, so, so what is keeping you from making this a reality? Mm-hmm. And I just, I just said money. Right. Mm-hmm. And she was like, okay, money, uh, anything else? And I was like, no, that's literally it. Mm-hmm. Only mm-hmm. money. And mm-hmm. then it just kind of like hit me. I was like, wait, that's not really acceptable to me mm-hmm. that money or like my thoughts about how I could make money. Cause it's not really mm-hmm. money. It's just yeah. my thoughts yeah. about what's possible mm-hmm. or how to, to make money. Mm-hmm. That that's the only thing keeping me from living a life that actually sounds really great and so much more amazing than the one I'm living now and so once I kind of realized that that like that was my real barrier I don't know I just started to feel like I can't let that be the case so I I'm just gonna figure something out and then I just kind of decided at one point like you know what I'm just gonna pay my loans back a dollar at a time if I have to (laughs) and eventually they may disappear and maybe yeah. I'll die and I'll still have them. And either yeah. way, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to like, I'm not going to not live my life yeah. because of this like kind of imaginary number that mm-hmm. I owe the government. You know what I mean? Like it just yeah. didn't feel, it didn't feel like the good thing to do. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like your story goes beyond than just a, oh, medical residency dropout, now a digital nomad and a career coach. There is a pressing issue that's flagrant in the United States and I guess other countries too, in regards to physician suicides, especially residents, right? Yeah. There are residents who literally don't want to be there, but cannot leave or think they cannot leave because of the amount of loan that have incurred already and what their families and friends would say. So I feel like your story is so imperative and integral for people to hear because there is a life outside of medicine for those who really don't want to be in there cannot see themselves in there because i feel like people are like right um certain residents are like oh i have no choice so i have to pull this through and then they are so meaningless they, they feel like life is so meaningless and i actually wanted to share this quick story of one of our cardiology fellows he told us about how he's always wanted to be a photographer growing up but mm-hmm. took medicine because his whole family is a line of physicians mm-hmm. and he was telling us one night when I was on ship and he was like it's just so sad to me how I call the shots in people's hearts but my own is not in it and mm-hmm. it it's such a deep and sad statement right and that could have been you too if you chose not to leave right so you talked in the past in the podcast about the power of intuition and i think that helps a lot in making that decision obviously i feel like your brain was and heart was flooded with doubt and probably fears of like you said shame and probably guilt where does intuition come into play into that how do you know that you you were making the right decision at that time how do you know that oh maybe i should wait until residency is over 
Yeah. So, well, first I just want to like comment on the physician suicide stuff because that really breaks my heart. And it really is something like you said, when people just feel like they have no Mm -hmm. options Mm -hmm. and they're stuck. And on my podcast on Monday, I actually interview a girl who struggled with suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. Like it's, Mm -hmm. she's like literally having this moment where she wants Mm -hmm. to, she's like on her way home from work and she like passes this kind of overpass. And she's like, what if I just like drive? Mm -hmm. And like mm-hmm. she was like literally having these suicidal mm-hmm. thoughts and so she ended up like overcoming them and mm-hmm. leaving mm-hmm. Residency. not to give it all away but like so we talk mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. we talk about that topic we're gonna mm-hmm. um, talk about it on the podcast that comes up on this coming Monday so in a few days because it's it's a really heartbreaking mm-hmm. thing and I know it can happen in any field but I mm-hmm. think in medicine there's just a lot I don't know it's it's definitely become a big thing and so mm-hmm. that's something that I'm glad you brought up and I think we need mm-hmm. to all address it and talk about it mm-hmm. more and yeah. So as far as intuition and how did I know I made the right decision and I didn't want to just finish residency part. Okay. Part of the reason I didn't want to just finish is because it it's not like a casual thing yeah. to just finish. Right. Like people say that as like, Oh, just, just, just it's finish like residency. Two and a half, it was still two and a half years. I was going to have to learn. Like to me, it was like, I don't want to do these surgeries. That was a big thing. I was like, I don't want to ever have to learn how to do a hysterectomy. I don't want to be the boss of a C-section. Like mm. there's just, and, and that's all OBGYN related. Yeah. And I didn't want to do any of that. That's for mm-hmm. sure. But it's not like I wanted to jump in and learn another specialty. So for yeah. me, it's like, I definitely yeah. didn't want to be an OBGYN. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. I would have had to match in a new thing. And I was like, I don't want to do that. And so it's like my energy and motivation to do anything else was like, no, I don't even want to, I don't want to put in Mm -hmm. any more energy to do anything else, but that's not even really the intuition part. So the intuition part is like, you don't really know, no, in the, in the way that we're used to knowing Mm -hmm. a lot of us, especially people in the medical field, we're used to like being able to rationalize and like, where's the evidence and here's the science. And these are the things that make sense and logical Mm -hmm. and intuition is not that. Yeah. It's just not. um, (laughs) So it's not on the plane of logic. It's not on the plane of like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. It's just on the plane of like a gut feeling, a knowing that Mm -hmm. you can't really explain and just Mm -hmm. kind of like this pull in your heart. Mm -hmm. Um, And people feel it in different ways. I know that like in in the the people I've worked with, like one of the things I do with my clients is we work on intuition and I help them Mm -hmm. learn how to get in touch with their intuition. One of my clients is very like visual. Like she would close Mm -hmm. her eyes and she would see images of things that were like, that she was kind of being led to. And so I think everyone can kind of get in touch with their intuition Mm -hmm. in their own ways. But in general, like we feel it more in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So our brains are kind of one Mm -hmm. area and it's not like wrong to do things in your brain, but I feel like when it's about making really big life decisions, my intuition is always right. Like it always knows mm-hmm. what to do. And so that's, that's what I did during my five weeks is I just yeah. like really connected to yeah. my intuition. And the way I do that personally is by being outside, by being in silence. Mm-hmm. So just like having time for silence. And then I journal, mm-hmm. I have a journaling practice where I kind of write to my intuition yeah. and it's, it's kind of like a prayer, like all of those things. And so mm-hmm. we all have that, right? Like we all have yeah. those times where like, we know and there's no reason we yeah. should know something but yeah. we're like this just feels no, right yeah. it's just that yeah. and it's like learning to trust that and yeah I think you know for most people it's good to start off small like the first time I listened to my intuition it was like should I go to this wedding of like it was a friend's wedding from college I really didn't want to go yeah. I had all these reasons why I shouldn't go but then in my intuition was like I feel like I should go and I went and it was amazing and I had such a great time so that's like a really low stakes yeah. Yeah. To, like, learn how to trust your intuition yeah that's great and Obviously, it has led you to beautiful places now, both geographically and also mentally in your life. I saw the pictures you shared when you were in residency. It's like your smile now is so different. I feel like, obviously, you're living the life that you want to live, right? And now that you are outside, have been outside the world of medicine, do you think or do you still or have you ever had any regrets for entering the field in the first place? Oh, for entering the field in the first place. Um, there's definitely times where I've thought, dang, if I if I hadn't have done this, like I would have been so much further along in my business. Yeah. But then when I whenever I think like little things like that, they're very fleeting. And I remember that I just did exactly what I wanted at the time. Yeah. And the person I was, I, I got into med school before my 21st birthday. <laughs> so the person I was oh. at that time. Yeah only wanted to go to med- to medical school that was like all she wanted and so yeah. she did it and realized that and I'm I'm a, kind of a stubborn person to where yeah. 
you know, and people told me, they're like, you don't want to do that. Because I would tell them like kind of what I wanted to do with my life. And I was like, I really like psychology and helping people. Yeah. And I'm going to go to med school. And they're like, what? No, you don't. You don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I just like, I don't listen because mm -hmm. I just do what I want to do. And mm -hmm. at that time, that's what I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. yeah, any regret is fleeting because yeah. you can only know what you know at the time. You know, and it's time. like if I make, if I try to like, rational or think about a decision from the past using what i know now it just it doesn't work like that yeah i feel like it all fit into place because because of your journey now you can also lead others who are burnt out in healthcare into this yeah. new path which i want to touch upon in your new career as a career coach and also digital nomad and traveling to all these beautiful places if you could just tell us the gist of what you do now for work now you're done and outside of medicine <laughs> Yeah, so it's taken several iterations. So like, you know, my first year, I didn't know anything about online businesses or that world. And so that first year, I was just teaching. So I got a regular like nine to five job had a stable income. And during that time, like learned all about how to start building an online business. And then the next year, I was able to I had some savings from teaching and I was able to like move to Vietnam and uh, kind of start my online business. And the idea was to kind of digital nomad and then COVID hit. And so then I ended up just staying in Vietnam for about eight uh, months. And uh, yeah, so it's really there's a lot of freedom involved. Uh -huh. And it's that has been interesting because when you don't have freedom, when you have to go into work at a certain time uh -huh. and you have to stay in one place all, like yeah. you know you don't have location freedom yeah you kind of have this you paint this idealized version of like what freedom is going to be like yeah. and then so I created all that for myself right I had location freedom I could go anywhere mm -hmm. I wanted because I worked online I had time freedom I could you know do client calls whenever I wanted to <laughs> I could work whenever like I had all the freedom and yeah. for a while I was like ooh, <laughs> like <laughs> it was a little bit stressful because yeah. it was almost like too much freedom and so yeah. I, and I wasn't mentally free in the sense mm -hmm. that I still like I was my own boss, but I wasn't a very nice boss to myself in that yeah. it's like, I still kind of had that hustle mentality for yeah. medicine where it's like, you need to work all the time. You got to be mm -hmm. doing this, mm -hmm. this. And so while creating external freedom is great, there's also so much internal work that needs to be done in order for you to be able to enjoy it. Right. And I'm, I'm just now starting to get to that place where it's like, yeah. I can see what needs to be done. I can see mm -hmm. when I get to enjoy things. And, and like, I, I have to really proactively and purposely create time to rest and yeah. and all of that. Changing your external circumstances really doesn't do anything yeah. unless you also start doing the internal work. Internal. Well. So that's been a really interesting part of, of this whole journey is realizing it, it didn't end when I left medicine. Mm -hmm. That was just the beginning. <laughs> just the <laughs> like beginning. Was, I just, agree. Like, it gave me the time and space yeah. to start. And you tap there as well, right? Yeah, exactly. That's amazing. <laughs> and now you, like I said, you help coach healthcare workers who are burnt out. And well, I guess you have a program, right? To like a stepwise manner, is it? Yeah, it's very stepwise. It's an eight week program called mm -hmm. the Career Fulfillment Formula. And we go through like through the eight weeks, there's like eight modules, eight workbooks, all the things. Mm -hmm. And we go through like there's three main phases. Mm -hmm. So the first phase is to release all the things that are not serving you, right? Mm -hmm. All the doubts, all the limiting beliefs, all the expectations from others, yeah. just releasing all, all the fears yeah. and things like that, releasing those things. And when I say release them, they don't just poof disappear, but you start to learn tools of how to manage them so that they don't impact you. Mm -hmm. And then in phase two, it's really like the kind of self-discovery Mm -hmm. piece where you get really clear on like who you are how you want to serve the world mm -hmm. what are your values what are your strengths your zone of genius mm -hmm. like what are those you know those things that you offer that like no one else really has like really yeah. getting clear on all of yeah. that and then finally in the third phase it's like the clarity phase so like mm -hmm. career clarity so then we put it all together and we create your like plan for yeah. what you want to do and yeah. where you go and so by the end of the eight weeks you have a really clear picture mm -hmm. of like what is what is it that you're here to do and mm -hmm. how how can you start moving in that direction so you have your like preliminary action plan so it's yeah. a really wonderful process and that's amazing because i feel like the hardest part is always the first step right of tackling certain things and also not knowing how to start the process and as you mentioned earlier we have a podcast coming up on monday which i'm so excited to listen to if we could please tell everyone about your podcast and where we could find it and listen to yeah it's on all the main podcast things it's called life after medicine 
And my goal of the podcast itself is to reach healthcare workers who are feeling unhappy in mm-hmm. their current careers, but feel stuck. Mm-hmm. Like, similar to the session, right? It's like you're mm-hmm. unhappy, but you just don't feel like there's any options. You feel stuck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so through the podcast, I'm sharing other people's stories who mm-hmm. have left like mm-hmm. the traditional clinical medicine, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily mean throw away everything. It doesn't mean, it doesn't yeah. mean doing exactly yeah. what I did, but yeah. it's just kind of, you don't have to necessarily do it in a way mm-hmm. that doesn't work for you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm sharing stories of people who've left traditional clinical medicine and mm-hmm. they're forging their own path to fulfillment. And that looks mm-hmm. different for so many people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I'm also doing solo episodes where I share just like different tips and perspective shifts mm-hmm. and things from my journey that have really helped me make this change. And it's, yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's been my favorite thing I've done so yeah. far. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I just want to ask if there's one thing that you could tell a burnt out healthcare worker or not even in healthcare but just a burnt out person in their career what would be that one message that you would tell them right now yeah it doesn't have to be that way you don't have to keep going around feeling burnt out I think we tell ourselves this really dangerous story that oh well work just sucks work is supposed to be mm-hmm. hard this is just mm-hmm. what being an adult is no, no. that is not true like mm-hmm. if you're burnt out, if you're miserable, if you're feeling exhausted, it doesn't have to stay that way. I agree. Thank you so much. And your story is a testament to that. And your story has inspired me for so long and continues to inspire me today. And please enjoy Brazil. I don't know how cold it is there right now. <laughs> <laughs> today was actually much better. There was sunshine. Everything was good. So I'm hoping it's taking a turn for the warm. Yes, I hope so too. Polar vortex before I, that. And I hope New York's heat also calms down a little yeah. bit because I'm going to melt any second. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christian. Have a good night. Bye.